Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax. I'm your host, Olivia Voltaggio, Senior Content Manager for the U.S. Information Solutions business, filling in for our regular host, Catherine Doe. 2023 is coming to a close, signaling that time of year when we reflect on the economy's performance and try to project the year ahead. It was big news this week when Moody's changed the U.S. credit rating outlook from stable to negative. Yet the U.S. GDP grew 4.9% in the third quarter, which was better than expected. It's been a year of mixed economic indicators. So to help us sort it all out, we are joined by David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks very much for having me, Olivia. And I want to be very clear, I'm on the uh, analytics side of the company. I'm not involved with the ratings. That's the investor services side. So I, I play a different role here. But uh, but thanks for having me here. Absolutely. Let's jump right in. Given the current economic performance, what factors are contributing to the intensifying headwinds as we approach the end of the year? So as the year draws to a close, the economy faces some significant challenges, despite the impressive performance we saw in the third quarter. While no single factor alone could cause the economy to falter, the combined impact of various issues could lead to a downfall. So we want to think about issues related to like the student loan payment moratorium coming to an end uh, or higher interest rates. Yes. How significant is the impact of the end of the student loan payment moratorium and the surge in long-term interest rates? I know that's a topic that we here at Equifax have been focused on for a few market pulses here. Yeah, we're seeing the impact of the end of the student loan payment moratorium right now, but we'll, it'll take several quarters before we see the, the full impact in the data, uh, but it is definitely occurring right now. Uh, it's expecting to impact 24 million borrowers who will have to resume paying around $300 per month, and this will lead to an annual increase of over $85 billion in payments. However, not all borrowers will resume payments, as President Biden's executive order has instructed student loan servicers not to report delinquent borrowers to credit bureaus. Uh, As a result, borrowers will prioritize their other obligations before paying back their student loans. Some borrowers will move into uh, income-driven repayment plans, reducing their monthly payments. Moreover, many borrowers have other financial resources they can use, so they will not necessarily cut back their spending by the total amount of their student loan payments. Despite this, the annualized real GDP in the fourth quarter is expected to be reduced by about 30 basis points. In terms of the interest rates, uh, the end in the surge in long-term interest rates is expected to significantly impact the economy, though the degree of this impact can vary across different sectors. The higher long-term interest rates are anticipated to reduce the annualized fourth quarter real GDP by 25 basis points. Therefore, the end of the surge could potentially alleviate this downward pressure, indicating a significant positive effect on the economy. So, David, with those higher interest rates that you mentioned, which parts of the economy are most likely to be impacted? The single-family housing sector uh, is the most rate-sensitive part of the economy, and it has experienced stagnation in home sales due to high interest rates. Homeowners are effectively locked into their homes and their mortgages, with home sales mainly occurring due to unavoidable life events. Uh, So think of, uh, you know, you you have another kid and you got to move to a bigger home, or you take a new job, right? That's that's what's causing a lot of the uh, the home sales right now. If interest rates decrease, uh, it could stimulate activity in the sector by making a little more economic sense for homeowners to move. You know, and the the higher rates have negatively affected other rate sensitive parts of the economy like stocks, business investment. There's a lot of talk about commercial real estate development right now. At the end of the um, surge could potentially alleviate a lot of the negative impacts from these higher interest rates and thus give a boost to this uh, sector. It is worth noting that the uh, economy now appears to be less sensitive to rates than in the past, and this is evidenced by uh, inc- uh, continued increase in housing completions despite the higher rates. So people are just still building uh, houses uh, despite high interest rates. Uh, therefore, the end of the surge may not have as much of an impact as we might have expected from historical patterns. Yes, as someone who just purchased their first home myself, I can certainly relate to being in that camp of people. With a potential 10-year treasury yield of 5% being unsustainable, why is a yield closer to 4% more likely by year's end? And how would this affect the overall economic outlook? 
So uh, we want to think about how we got to 5% rate for a 10-year treasury yield. It, really, there's two main factors driving this. Uh, higher expected short-term rates um, and an increased term premium. The, the higher short-term rates are coming from investor expectations of the Federal Reserve's uh, future monetary policy, you know, which is expected to maintain short-term rates for longer due to the economy's resilience. Uh, in terms of the – for the term premium – the, um, that's really been driven by uh, Treasury debt issuance, reduced demand uh, from the Federal Reserve, and potentially market uh, sentiment. So given these factors, a yield closer to 4% uh, by the end of the year seems to be a little bit more likely as it's going to balance the need for higher returns to compensate long-term investment uncertainties and the expectation that the Federal Reserve will maintain a cautious approach to rate adjustments. The overall economic outlook in this scenario of a 4% yield would depend on how well the economy can absorb this rate. Because again, it is still fairly high rate by recent historical standards. If businesses and households can maintain the higher borrowing costs, the impact of, on growth should hopefully be limited. However, if the higher interest rates lead to a, a significant slowdown in borrowing and spending, it could dampen economic activity uh, potentially too much. Um, and that's uh, obviously the scenario that everybody's concerned about that the Fed might cause recession. Uh, so the you know it's going to be important for the uh, Fed to keep inflation expectations anchored throughout all of this, uh, and hopefully that will help maintain economic stability. And I think with the recent data points that we're seeing, the the Fed seems to be winning the battle uh, in terms of inflation expectations as um, you know the CPI increases are are slowing down. And David, can you break down the estimated 1.35 percentage points annualized hit to real GDP in the fourth quarter? And how do factors like the UAW strike, the potential government shutdown, higher oil prices, or the surge in long-term interest rates contribute to this? Yeah, we're breaking this down into several different components. Uh, the, the two biggest pieces are going to be the student loan payment moratorium and the UAW strike. We're thinking that's going to be about 30 basis points each uh, of the 1.35 percentage point annualized hit. Um, and then the rest is going to be divided up between uh, a government shutdown, higher oil prices, and then the, um, the higher long-term rates. Then despite these economic headwinds, the real GDP in the quarter is expected to be just barely positive and near 1% in the first quarter of 2024. How can the economy maintain resilience amidst these challenges? Well, I think there's a good chance that the economy can remain resilient. Again, growth was really high last quarter, and, and so hopefully that can continue and produce some momentum um, into the fourth quarter. We are seeing uh, moderating inflation, which should bring down rate expectations, uh, and, and that, again, will encourage more investment. And then we are seeing uh, improvements in supply overall. And so all of this, I think, is, is good news. And we also want to keep in mind that uh, you know, and there's a lot of debate out there, but there does seem to be some excess savings amongst consumers, uh, typically amongst older or uh, higher income individuals. But there is a fair bit of uh, excess savings as well. So um, consumers may uh, continue to, to spend um, and thus they'll drive the economy forward. There are darker scenarios, however, and uh, you know that's something we need to be aware of. Uh, we're worried about what could happen to oil prices or uh, an extended uh, government shutdown. Those are definitely concerns that are, are very realistic. And then, you know, in the event that first the long-term interest rates did come back up again, that would obviously be a, a, a negative and, and uh, slow the economy down further. And shifting gears a bit to close out on a positive note, what about bright spots? What can we look forward to? And what are your recommendations for businesses and consumers for next year? Well, I think one of the bright spots that we haven't discussed here would be really uh, along the supply side. And that's, you know, construction and vehicle producing industries for the most part are really recovered from the pandemic era disruptions. And so that should be a, a strong boost going uh, forward. Uh, and then I would say for any businesses out there, you want to be prepared for any, any you know, government shutdowns or any economic slowdowns and, and really be uh, concerned about you know, your financial stability. Uh, you know, and, the, and you can also focus on you know, improving efficiency and reducing costs. And I think the best thing consumers can do right now you know, given that there is some uncertainty still out there, is to just, you know, save, invest wisely, 
uh, you know, be prudent with all your credit decisions, right? That's um, that's something I think that consumers need to do going forward, and and hopefully, you know, the economy can do its part. But uh, it doesn't hurt to to prepare a bit here. David, thank you so much for joining us today. If our audience would like to follow up with you, where can they find you? So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, just at David Fieldhouse on LinkedIn, or send a note to Help Economy at Moody's.com. Thank you again, David. And if you enjoyed today's episode, tell your friends about us and subscribe. If you'd like to send us questions or suggested topics for future episodes, email us at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. And don't forget to register for our Market Pulse webinar series at equifax.com slash marketpulse. Our team of experts works hard to provide relevant economic and credit insights to help your business make more confident decisions and build resilience to help you focus on forward. Thanks for listening, and please join us next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.